Let me begin reading. Apart from God, man has to form his own opinion and aspirations for himself apart from God. His view can only be an estimation of his own self-worth, an estimation. He has no real procedure or reference point to measure his value apart from God. Then I want to make this statement. Never use someone else's personal opinion about your personal value. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't, don't take a survey. What do you think about me? What do you think about me? What do you think about me? To develop your own opinion. You find that in the Word of God. You find out what God, who God is and what He wants for you, His plan for you. It's already in your spirit. You may not see it and recognize it, but it's there. God has a plan for you. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it uh, through the stories of others, of things that happened to them when going back about as far back as they remember, uh, of things that was happening in their life then Later, it was almost like it was telling a story of what God was going to do in the future. Let me say this. No one, no person, we're talking about people, we're talking about you. No person can put you down, can disqualify you, or displace you from the plan and will of God if you are seeking God's plan and God's will. Does that make sense? Amen. I want to make sure you understand that because there will always be those who will try to discourage you, who will try to put you down, who will, the devil will try to displace you, and you might even get off on the wrong path. Amen. We have thousands of testimonies on the wrong path, but God puts something in our spirit, and if we'll turn to him, he'll put us on the right path. It's already in our spirit, and that's why many people do things that they shouldn't ought to do. It's because there's something in their spirit, and they know it should be better than this. They, they know that they should have a greater sense of self-worth than they have, but they've never found the reference point in Christ. Unless we see the hand and plan of God upon our own life, we will be consumed with the illusion that being someone else would be better. Amen. Have you ever thought you would be better being someone else? Many times, too many times, that illusion comes when people want to be like someone they've seen, they've seen on television, movie star. A movie star who is doing nothing but acting out, portraying the life of something they are not themselves. Or what if, what if you've seen someone, let's say even a newscaster, and you think, oh, that, that person is so great, so popular, uh, attractive, and so forth, but all that person is doing is reading the notes someone wrote for them. And God wants you to read the notes he wrote for you. Amen? Is this okay? Is this okay? The plan of God is in your spirit. Now, people have a tendency to favor their own opinion. Normally, I like my opinion, but I found too often uh, that's not good enough. You know, something to add to that, too many times, my own opinion of myself was very low, and that's why I have to find it in God. People have a tendency also to push the limits. Have you ever been around someone that liked to push the limits? And uh, when we're talking about spiritual matters, we could say push the limits of grace, push the limits of uh, doing it our way. Usually when people are pushing the limits, they're pushing the limits away from God. How many times have you ever seen, how many times have you experienced in your own life that you were pushing the limits to see how close you could get to God? How close you could get to God's favor. How close you could draw near to God when he said, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. How many times and, and how many hours, how many minutes, how many days, how many weeks or years have you pushed, endeavored to push the limits and push and push and push to see how close you could get to God? 
I'm letting you answer that question. Have you ever thought, and I pay attention to these things, more than I'm aware, more than many around me. Not everyone, not more than everyone around me, but I pay attention to these things and have for many years. Pushing the limits. Have you ever noticed, and, and I, I get feedback, I get pushback on these things. I get some bad things sent my way on these things. Uh, How many Christians do you know that think it's okay to kill the unborn baby because it's illegal to have an abortion? Is that a sobering thought? And how many Christians in certain places think it's okay now we're going to smoke marijuana because it's illegal? And so uh, that brings me to a, a question what if murder was legal? <laughs> Talk about depopulation. Half of you wouldn't be here, you know? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> Maybe not that many. If it was legal. Remember the broken body of Jesus. And they murdered him. The innocent one the lover of their soul, the son of the living God in human flesh. They murdered him. And who was behind it? The religious people for many reasons. They didn't want to conform. They didn't want to repent. They weren't among those who were in the river of Jordan being baptized by John. Uh, it just, it was the religious people. Okay, people have a tendency to favor their own opinion. I get it, but guys, if you're just favoring your own opinion and you're thinking from an earthly view, you're going to get something wrong. That's why we need God's view. That's why we need God's word. People have a tendency to push the limits, and people have a tendency to be lazy. Amen. If I would ask all the lazy people to raise their hands, but they'd probably be too lazy to raise their hands, you know? <laughs> people have a tendency to take the easy road, and people have a tendency to take offense. Remember the broken body of Jesus. Isn't that amazing, Jesus? Even though he came to them to minister to them and to die for them, they turned against him, and they, he was dying for them, and they killed him. Amen. Amen. It's, uh, they murdered him, the one that, they, that came to rescue them. Now, the only good thing about that is Jesus, the rescue of God was in that plan. Now, if you came to rescue me and I murdered you, Man, I don't even like to talk about that. Let's say someone else. If you, if you came to rescue someone and they murdered you instead, they would be lost. They would not be rescued. But the ones Jesus came to rescue, they murdered him. They cried, crucify, crucify, get rid of him, crucify him. And the good part about that is that was the plan. He had to die so he could rescue them. Can you imagine how many people were standing at the cross that repented and got saved, accepted Christ later? I don't know how many. I don't know who they were, but there was something happening in the spirit realm right there at that time, in that place. Remember the broken body of Jesus. And when you feel like you're broken... Remember, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. God wants a broken and contrite spirit, not a proud, haughty, arrogant spirit. Did you know it's the proud, haughty, arrogant spirit that justifies their own sin, that justifies their own sin, but there is no justification? Did you know you can justify what you do wrong as long as you want to all day long and justify it? 
but it don't make you right with God. The only way you're justified with God is if you repent and turn, then he justifies you and makes it as though it didn't happen. Are you aware of that? Amen. Amen. Three of you are. <laughs> Remember, the plan of God is in your spirit. So people have a tendency to be lazy, but they also have a tendency to fear. You remember the stormy sea and Jesus is asleep inside the, the boat and, and they're afraid because the waves are coming over the boat. I remember being in a boat like that one time. You know, Zach's trying to get us to go deep sea fishing. Well, the last time and the only time I ever went deep sea fishing, uh, the waves were coming over the boat. And uh, we went out and they thought it would, the swells would be three to five feet. The wind, the storm was out of the north. We went out and, and the swells were nine to 12 feet. And you talk about being up and being down. I had to step down into the hole for a bit. And when I came out, I came out crawling on my hands and knees. <laughs> and I leaned over the side of the boat and... Ronnie White was too. <laughs> and they were making fun of Ronnie. And they were saying, oh, poor pastor. <laughs> poor pastor. <laughs> but I know inside they were laughing at me, you know. <laughs> and, and then on the way back in, the captain of the ship said, he said, I don't know what you boys do. He said, if you pray... If you speak things forth, he said, I don't know how you do it, but he said, whatever you do, start doing it now. <laughs> and on the way back in, it took us three hours to get in. On the way back in, the waves were coming up over the front of the boat and going all the way near to the back of the boat. It was quite a ride. People have a tendency to fear, and I understand the stormy sea. And they went down and woke Jesus up and and he got up, and I don't think he was having a bad day, but it may have sounded to them like he was having a bad day. And he said, oh, you of little faith. It looks like you're going to drown. It looks like you're going to sink to the bottom of the sea. And he accused them. He said, oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Remember the cup. Remember the blood. When it looks like you're about to go down, remember what Jesus purchased. He purchased your soul. Yeah, but he didn't purchase my body. But your soul is inside. He purchased your soul. And he brought healing for your body. You don't have to be afraid. Even when it looks like the ship is going down, you don't have to be afraid. Even if the ship is going down, you don't have to be afraid. He's the lover of your soul. Somebody said, under the right conditions, I have to be afraid. That's your selection. Jesus taught us, commanded us, do not fear. Do not be afraid. Remember the blood. Remember what he purchased. He purchased your soul. He purchased your life. He saved your life, and he is for you. I mean, that's why he entered in, and he was celebrated because they had seen the... the uh, the miracles, they had seen the things that he had done, and they celebrate him when he marches into Jerusalem, riding on the young, the colt of a donkey, and they're laying palm branches in the road, and they're even their coats in the road, so the hooves will not touch the road, honoring him. And it was just a few days later they began to cry, crucify. They knew what they saw, they knew what was in the past, but now there are people that are starting rumors, and even the Bible said false accusations, so they started saying, crucify him, crucify him. Well, remember the blood. Let me read. People have the tendency to reduce the things of God and to exalt the things of mankind. Have you ever exalted the bonus on your paycheck above the streets of gold? You know, we... we there are two things that in life we can seek for the trophies of the world. And it's amazing how we mentor even our children to seek for the trophies of the world. But God wants us to seek for the treasures in heaven. And if you compare the treasures in heaven to the trophies on this earth, 
there, there is a vast distinction. Amen. It's worth whatever it takes in your life to receive the treasures from heaven because the trophies of the world will fade away. And what about the trophies of the world today? Everybody gets the same trophy today. You know, all the kids, they get the same trophy today. Well, let me just go on. Man, I could linger there for a while. <laughs> People have the tendency to reduce the things of God to exalt the things of mankind. We have reduced Daniel in the lion's den to a child story when it was intended to be a standard in our daily lives. What do you do when the devil has you bound with fear and deceit? When he has you beaten down and you're feeling all alone, do you stand up and fight? Do you gather your five smooth stones? Do you remember the blood? Do you remember the bread? Do you remember the broken body of Jesus? Do you recall the cup that represented the blood of Christ and what he did for you? Or do you cringe in fear and run and hope someone will save you? You know, as much as I appreciate and value what Donald Trump did for our nation, possibly will do again, we would like to think probably, uh, as much as I value that, Donald Trump is not your Savior, cannot be your Savior, and never will be your Savior. Amen. Neither will anyone in this building. Amen. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. He's our only hope. He's the rock. He's the foundation. Theology re classes, theology classes reduce Jonah in the whale to a myth. And I remember going back, mercy, just right at 50 years ago friend of mine taking theology classes and they were teaching him that all of the stories throughout the Old Testament were nothing but myths. Do you know what was sad? He believed them. In theology, in one of our colleges in Abilene, one of our Christian colleges in Abilene, almost 50 years ago, that I was, became aware of it. So they reduced Jonah and the well to a myth. What are you going to do when God is trying to get your attention and you decide you'd rather be in the belly of a big fish than to do his will? If you believe Jonah is just a myth, even if you act like it was just a myth. You see, we're talking about people. People have a tendency to draw away from God. People have a tendency to trust in themselves to trust themselves and trust in themselves. And that's why it's important that we repent, we surrender, and we put our trust in God, we put our faith in God, we put our confidence in God. And then we lose all our struggles because too many times our struggles will come with ourselves or because of ourselves. Sure, David and Goliath is... Now, David and Goliath is an attention getter. So is... Uh, Daniel in the lion's den, and one story after another. We call them stories, but these were realities. We call them stories, Bible stories, and we love to teach them to our children because when we teach them and portray them and act them out, our children get engrossed in these things because it is so incredible, and they love these things. But then we grow up, and we think of them as mere children's stories instead of taking the advantage of what God intended to do with us. So I just say, come on now, quit reducing God to less than mortal man and begin walking in the Spirit and allow the Spirit of God within you to live, to thrive, and cause you to experience the, manifest, the manifestation power of God. Amen. I mean, I want God's power manifested in my life every day. And when I'm going through things, when I'm going through things, I'm trusting God and I'm believing God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 
Job 33 and 4 said, The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty God gives me life. When you reduce God within yourself, you will automatically begin to reduce the witness of God in others. You won't believe what God is doing in others, even though they tell you. Because you've reduced God within yourself, and you've exalted yourself above Him, and you think you're better than Him. You, you read the Word of God, and you say, well, that's not for me. You... You pray and you might feel leading of God, but you do what you want to do. You continue doing what you want to do. The Bible calls that rebellion. And you reduce the witness of God in others, and pretty soon you'll be telling them, you can't do that, and then you'll believe God can't do it for you either. I have too many thoughts and not enough time to share all of them. Because it's time we begin to profess and confess what we believe God can do instead of trying to limit everybody with, with what we think or decide he can't do. There's not one thing he can't do except for lie. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. He cannot mislead you. All things are possible through Christ within you. And you can trust God for any and every need, every aspect of your life. He is your creator. You can trust him. And I believe God wants us to have a renewal of faith and confidence in God like we have never known before. Amen. 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 The plan of God is in your spirit. What did he do for those? And even, even many died just as Jesus died. What if you were to die for the cause of Christ? How would that make you feel? Well, for a moment it might make you feel dead, but it would make you feel alive through the resurrection. Amen. And through the eternal rewards, it would make you feel alive. Amen. Everybody's afraid to die, and we don't have to be afraid. Amen. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid of rejection. And you don't have to be afraid of poverty. You don't have to be afraid when you put your trust in the true and living God, the lover of your soul. But we don't want to forfeit comfort and inconvenience. Maybe I need to just keep going for another hour. We, we, we don't want to forfeit comfort and inconvenience. And we sure don't want anyone to disagree with us. I like my opinion more than anyone else's. The plan of God is in your spirit. And he can, I like the way... It goes in Hebrews as Hebrews is what we call the, the chapter of faith. Uh, it talks about all the patriarchs and the men of God that trusted God and believed God. But I like where it goes into beginning in verse 32. He said, and what shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jep Zephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. He said, I don't, I don't have time to go through all of these stories. I've already gone through a few of the others, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, or not David, but uh, uh, some of the others. And he said, now, he said, who through faith conquered kingdoms, these men conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. He said, I don't have time to go through this. There's countless, countless more people. And then it continues like this. They quenched the fury of the flames. They escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. I love that. Who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Oh, that's just a myth, is it? Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Oh, that was just given as an illustration. Is that true? It goes on into verse 36. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. Some they were just laughed at and that was persecution. But he said there were others who were chained and put in prison. And I... 
I've seen, I, I've seen the prison that Paul was held in when he was in Rome. Paul and Peter, I've been there. I looked through, through the, the bars. And I've seen dungeons uh, in some of the old, old castles. And I've seen the, the things, how they, how they tormented men just for the pleasure of tormenting their enemies. And it's gruesome. It's awful. They were stoned and they were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. And it said the world was not worthy of them. Wow. When was the last time you read this and meditated on it? It's pretty wild. You know, a thousand more things could be said here, but, but I need to move on just a little bit. Here's the part I really want to get to. The plan of God is in your spirit. The plan of God is in there. So when you know what the plan of God is, you're willing to go through and walk through anything that you have to. The plan of God is in your spirit. The plan, did you know the plan of God is in your spirit to build? Maybe not everyone. God put it in my spirit to build. I've been a builder all my life. And uh, I just love to build. I, I, I enjoy building. Uh, but it's not just with wood or metal or or stone. God wants us to build a family. Build a family strong. A family with a good foundation. A family with walls and, a, and protection overhead. A family. God wants us to know how to build a business. And when God puts it in your business to do, not everyone has it in their spirit to do business. Some people are very, very poor at doing business. But some people have it in their spirit and they're very, very, very good at doing business. God wants us to build a business to do good. God wants us to know how to build a church, make it strong. Did you know that there are, if you have a good foundation, you can make the church strong, but if you don't do it right, you can't build a strong church, a lasting ministry. If you don't do it right, you can actually tear it down. God wants us to build a nation. The same thing is true of a nation. If you do it right, it can be right. Romans 15 verses 1 and 2 says, We who are strong, some of you are strong, we who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Not to make him happy with his sin or her sin, but to build him up and do what is right. The plan of God is in your spirit to build. And the plan of God is in your spirit to possess. Did you know there's many people that literally think it's wrong if they possess too much? But God puts it in your spirit to possess. And there are those who, who have been taught and mentored that it's wrong to possess uh, and so they are willing to live from paycheck to paycheck as long as they have a credit card that keeps escalating, escalating, escalating. Amen. I hope, I'm, I hope I don't sound facetious. I hope I'm making sense. Well, I can't believe God wants us to possess. I've had to talk with men recently. It's going through the fire in carbon, and they just can't believe that God wants good for them or the best for them. But the... The Bible is clear, the Old Testament is clear that God had a promised land for his people and it was flowing with milk and honey. God wants you to possess. He puts it in your spirit to possess. The inheritance that is all through the scripture is the plan of God. The inheritance means you have rightful ownership. And God wants to give you something and you inherit something. And the inheritance also speaks of eternity. We used to sing the song, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. And we believed in the streets of gold. Is that a fairy tale? Is it a myth or is it true? We believed in the streets of gold. We believed in the crystal sea and the glory of God being there and we believed in all that kind of stuff. But yet we, I was cultured, mentored that uh, uh, if, I, 
ask too much, if I required too much, if I wanted too much, there was something wrong with me. God put it in your spirit to possess. And some of you know how to possess things without them possessing you, okay? And then God wants, he put it in our spirit to overcome. You don't have to put up with all the little things that you put up with. Amen. 1 John 5, verses 4 through 5. For everyone born of God. Do I have the wrong? Do I have the wrong translation? Didn't it say for a few of you who are born of God? Which translation am I? No, I'm sure I got the right one. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Wow, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. We have to believe. Believe that God is who he said he is. Believe that God will do what he said he will do. And believe that God means what he says. Amen. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only who... Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Praise God. He came to give you victory as he gives you grace and as he changes your life, your heart, your, your path. You are supposed to become successful. Successfulness is the ability to overcome the obstacles that consistently come our way. You are found to be more resilient than you think. Engage the enemy. Every man needs a battle. Every man needs a battle. You need to go through the hard times and face the hard times. And in that battle, you're fighting. You may cost you sleep. may cost you energy. Every man needs a battle. We need a purpose for being. Some say it like this. We just need a win. Yes, you do. You need to go out and win. Man, is this, does this sound right? Man, you need to go out and win. And don't forfeit your victories. If we are more than conquerors, then somewhere we must go forth and conquer. Amen? Have you ever thought about that? If we are more than conquerors, somewhere you must go forth and conquer. Conquer and do what's right and maintain your faith and not shrink back. Not give sway to every wind of doctrine, the Bible says. Not, not concede to every voice that rises against the plan and will of God. But you stand. You be firm. You know what God wants. Stand. And don't let people sway you. God never changes, but you never stop changing. The plan of God is in your spirit, and he has great plans for you. God is so good. The plan of God is in your spirit. and I don't know what's in your spirit, but I can go back to a young boy. I, I still, I've never forgotten that scene. It's, it's almost as though I was looking down from above in this direction. But my brothers and sisters, I don't know how many of us there were at that time, Later, we totaled nine siblings, but at that time, I don't know how many, a bunch of us. And they would sit in the chairs outside in the backyard, and I was always the preacher. I have no clue what I preached. I probably preaching to them and saying something like Isaiah said, you stiff neck and heart uncircumcised. I don't have... <laughs> I do not have a clue what I said. But I remember them sitting there and listening to me. I don't even know if I had a Bible in my hand. But I remember, remember them. And I remember that little part chihuahua, part toy terrier sitting there at the end of the chairs. And I guess he was listening to, you know, I told you dogs don't go to heaven. He might have. I don't know. He might have. plan of God is in your spirit and so I hope the essence of this message can come across what God is putting in your spirit 
not, not with the things you're dealing with in your flesh, but with what God is putting in your spirit. Give credence to what God wants. And he's put things in there, greater things than what normally we would allow. But he's put things in, in your spirit. There's a thousand things to be said about that. But let the spirit minister, let the spirit mentor you. What has, what has God put in your spirit? What is it that that thing of faith that sometimes you're losing sight of, that thing of faith that sometimes it's like a, a thin string that's being broken, that thing that sometimes it's just so faint in your mind, but sometimes it's so pressing like a, the greatest conviction. And God just wants to remind you His plan is in your spirit. His spirit is in your spirit. Amen. I think we have a God that's worthy to worship, a God that's worthy of praise. Let me invite you to stand and let's worship as Christina leads us in, in song. I believe at this moment what God wants us to do as we are beginning to close. I believe that at this moment God wants us to possess something that we can take home. In the midst of all our troubles, anguish, anxiety, fears, troubles, doubts, in the midst of all those, He wants us to take praise, praise home with us. 
a praise that brings joy, a praise that builds up, a praise that encourages. He wants us to take it home. Hosanna in the highest. And there may be someone here that's never accepted Christ as Savior, but yet you know there's something in your spirit. In your spirit. You see, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, I believe it's 13 and verse 1, that God has set eternity in the hearts of every man. And there's something inside of you, and you know there has to be more to life than this. And the end has to be better than the beginning. And it is. It can be. But you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, but you can. And you can know Him today. You can know Him today. And all you have to do is make Jesus your Lord. I'd like to lead you in in a prayer, accepting Christ as Savior. If you would like to pray this prayer, and I hope you do. I hope you do. If I thought it would work, I would beg and beg and beg, beg for you too. But if I have to beg for you too, then I will have to keep begging you to continue. But if you have a heart of repentance, and you have, it's your personal choice, and you have a, a heart and a song of praise within your spirit, and you want to render your life to God, then I would like to ask you to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe you. You are my God. There is none like you, none in the heavens or the earth. You're the God of eternity. You're the creator of heaven and earth. You're the lover of my soul. I believe, I believe that Jesus is your son, your only begotten son, whom you sent to this earth through Mary. And he came as a baby and became a man until he gave himself as a ransom for my soul. By the brokenness of his body and by the shedding of his blood, so my sins may be washed away. I accept this Jesus as my Savior, and I make Jesus my Lord. Jesus. You are my Lord. And Father, I will serve you all the days of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of every one of them, my weakness, my failure, my pride. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from my shame. And Father, I pray you would remove it and take it all away to be no more, no more, and heal me from my pain torments, pain that's on the inside or the outside, heal me from my pain. I trust you, Father. I remember the broken body of Christ that was for my healing. You are my God. Jesus is my Savior. I render all my thanksgiving and gratitude toward you, and I will serve you until you call me home. I say so and I pray in Jesus' name. If you believe that, would you give him praise? If you prayed that prayer, would you give him praise? He is the lover of your soul. We love you. God bless you.